uh, Amber and her efforts to win the seat in Congress. And so today we're going to be talking about the future of work. As you know, the workforce is changing and it is very vital and very important that mm -hmm. you be prepared for what is ahead because COVID has changed up a lot of things. But even prior to COVID, they were making plans that auto, um, artificial intelligence will be changing the future. So therefore it is imperative that you be prepared. And so today we're going to be talking, our town hall Tuesday is about the future of work. So uh, I've introduced myself. Uh, let's hear from Amber. No problem. Thank you, Sarita. I really appreciate you for taking time out of your schedule um, to talk with me and moderate this panel. Um, a lot of folks sent in questions, so I'm super excited about that. We also added some of our own questions in. Uh, so thank you once again. Um, so my name is Amber Ivy. I'm running for uh, Maryland's seventh congressional district as an independent for Congress. Um, my background is really quickly. Uh, most of my work has been in operations and government performance operations while I was in the private sector and government performance um, while I when I was operating in the public or nonprofit se sectors. I'm super excited to be here today. I'm really excited to talk to you all about all the amazing things that are happening in the future of work and how we can prepare for it and not wait for it to happen to us. And other than that, let's let's get it started. So let's get started. You said future work. Can you tell us a, what is the term future of work? Tell us a little bit about that. So um, it's a relatively new term, um, Sarita, and I know you know a lot about this, mm -hmm. but it came about not that long ago, but it really talks about how uh, artificial intelligence as well as on-demand type jobs like gig, gig economy jobs let me break that down a little bit further <clears throat> excuse me gig economy is like the uber eats of the world or people who are driving as an uber driver or signing up as a delivery uh, person in any other of those fields but mm -hmm. they expect that artificial intelligence as well as the way that we're changing the way we do work is going to drastically impact the future of work so when you hear mm -hmm. people talking about the future of work it literally means artificial intelligence and on the job skills um and that's like the way the biggest way to explain it Good stuff. All right. So what do you, do you have any concerns about the future of work? <laughs> yes, I do. Um, if you have it. received any of my, uh, any of the text messages from my campaign or looked at the mini video I put together last week, one of the biggest concerns is that predictions say that up to 38% of skills or jobs will no longer be available due to automation. What does that mean? Um, things like artificial intelligence, technology, um, those things will replace the current skills that exist currently. That is, and it's hitting a lot of different areas, like lawyers, I think I've talked about this before, but lawyers uh, being able to do contracts or create documents, computers are better at that. They've proven that. Um, telehealth, as it relates to doctors being able to work with their uh, patients from a distance, like things like that can actually reduce the amount of people you need in a place because you can do telehealth in rural areas as well as in the city areas. Mm -hmm. So there's all these different areas of work that are going to drastically change, especially considering like manufacturing, even as it relates to truck drivers. We know that they already are testing out 18 wheelers that are um, autonomous drivers, meaning they drive their, the car drives itself. So mm -hmm. all these things are happening. So with that being said, the question is, what do we do to ensure that people have the skills they need to continue to compete in this job market because i am concerned that if you lose 38 percent of jobs by 20 or as early as 2030 that's in 10 years what are we doing to ensure that we're preparing people with the skills they need the um different training they need the ability to take benefits from one position to another like there's so many different issues that pop up with that and hopefully we'll get to talk through a lot of that stuff today but it's just so many things we need to think about when we think about the future of work we're not in our, uh, in, in like my parents' day where they could work at, in the government for 30 years and retire there or work in one job for 30 plus years and retire there. We're in an economy where people work in a job for two years here, three years there, one year here, and yeah, and they're gone. So mm -hmm. how do you make sure that person has a retirement? How do you make sure that person has benefits? How do you make sure that person has life insurance? When all those things are literally attached to your job and we know in the future that work is not gonna be the same. Right. So it sounds like the um, artificial intelligence and things of the nature will affect all types of industries. I heard you talk about the legal industry, the health industry, service mm -hmm. workers. And what I do know is that many of the brown people are going to be affected at a disproportionate rate. So right. we really have to start preparing people to get build their skill sets up. Now, even in COVID, there are so many 
free options for people right. to get skills, but then you also have to deal with people are, do they have the technology? So they'll be able to pull up these free stuff. So there's mm -hmm. so many things um, that are affecting that. But since we're talking about technology. Let me say one quick thing to what you just said. I think what one thing that you just said is key is that you said that people may not even have the tools right. to do so. In COVID right now, that I know there are a lot of kids, whether it's Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Howard County, who don't have access to computers at home. And some of them don't have access to broadband or high-speed mm -hmm. internet. So if we know we're moving towards an economy that's gonna have more of these things, then mm -hmm. how do we ensure that those people are gonna be prepared? How do we ensure right. that kids are gonna be prepared to do distance learning and those things? So I, I'm glad you point that out because just because technology is booming doesn't mean it's gonna make everything equal for everyone. There's still right. a digital divide. There's still a digital gap right. where some people don't even know how to use laptops and things like that and let alone have them or have access to internet in their home right right good stuff um so i've heard for many years that robots are going to take over our jobs so do you really believe that robots are going to take over our jobs well my i robot roomba took over my job of <laughs> vacuuming the floor so like i know people say that and they're afraid and we've all seen the i robot movie where robots take over and like there's there's like this middle ground of yes we need to be aware that technology is going to replace jobs period like right. that is going to happen will they take over every single job a human does that's not that's not realistic we're not going to be right. in a society where it's completely robot run and humans aren't right. doing anything but watching netflix um and uh just hanging out on the couch no we still need right. humans there one to program those robots to ensure that there's ethical things that are happening or what have you. But what that, what that statement really means is that we are increasing automation in our society. So mm -hmm. with that being said, how do we make sure people have the skills they need? Um, and for me, I'm concerned that we are not preparing in Washington to ensure that folks have the skills they need. Like mm -hmm. at this point with the way um, that jobs are set up, we should be in, um, incentivizing companies, training employees in new skills, the skills of the future. Um, colleges, incentivizing colleges to actually look at the future of work and make mm -hmm. sure they have careers that line up with that. Like, it amazes me to this day how many colleges don't have technology as part of their curriculum, like not included in that. When we know technology is akin to keyboarding class at this point, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there, I have concerns that we aren't incentivizing those behaviors. Now, some private companies have already started doing it. Like, there are companies that have already pushed ahead and said, I'm gonna go ahead and train my employees because I know it's changing. And a lot of those companies are tech companies because they know more than anyone else that things are gonna change rapidly. Especially when we get to the world of like quantum computing, artificial intelligence, predictive analytics, all these things that literally will speed up all the innovation even faster. They right. understand that and they're making sure they train their employees in that. But we have to make sure across the board that's happening no matter what your field is, that you do have those opportunities. And then as a personal, um, a uh, personal step we can take, incentivizing that through tax credits. If I decide to go get training in a new skill, giving a person a tax credit to do that. There are ways to do this where we can ensure that people have access and have the skills they need to compete in a future market. I'm concerned that folks are going to be, their eyes are going to be wide shut. And then when it happens, they're going to be like, oh, shoot, I'm losing my job. What do I do? And we can prepare for that now. We know that that's coming. Okay. Sounds good. Now, COVID has affected everything. It has affected mm -hmm. the way we go to the store. It has affected the way we go to work, how we interact, how right. uh, just laid to rest someone and I did a drive up funeral. And so mm. COVID has affected everything. So how has, made, how has COVID made you think differently about work and the workforce itself? Mm -hmm. No, that's a um, good question because like you said, we literally had to change on a dime how we did education, how we're doing funerals, how we do hospital visits that aren't related to COVID how we um, communicate with our family members, how we spend time with one another, that literally changed. And the one common denominator to a lot of that stuff is innovation. Um, those who were able to keep, um, keep moving during this moment found innovative ways to ensure that they could keep doing business as usual and things they're normally used to doing. For example, like you went to a drive-up funeral. Mm -hmm. Other people in other states, they kind of cancel, some places cancel funerals where you can only have uh, mm -hmm. groups of 10 at a grave site or what have you. And then I've had, I've been invited to a Zoom funeral. Um, so there's things like that that are happening where people are trying to get creative with how they do this. COVID, mm -hmm. um, the, the, not necessarily the disease per se, but COVID and the reaction to COVID has let us know that times can change at a drop of a dime. And we do need to have plans in place to ensure that we can adjust and that we can be innovative. 
Right. And the good thing about Americans and people living in this country, they figure it out and they're going to innovate and they're going to do what they need to do. But imagine if we had a better plan knowing that if something like this hits, the Congress or whoever can say, hey, this is our doomsday plan or this is our this is our plan for if crap goes down in these situations, not to the point mm -hmm. where we're at the end of the world or anything like that. But like if this happens, then we need to make sure these things are activated and these things are put into place. And that's what I was concerned about for COVID because a lot of folks had to figure it out on their own. Some didn't. And those aren't those jobs probably aren't coming back. Like they're mm -hmm. estimating a ridiculous, like almost 50% of company or jobs may not um, recover after this to their to where they are before COVID. And that's a concern. And if you add on top of that, what's gonna happen in the future with technology, you're gonna lose even more jobs. So we have to be, uh, as the government and how the government should work for the people is to make sure that we protect people from things like this, right? If people are doing their everyday life, living and doing what they need to do, we should make sure that something like this does not wipe out someone's saving account. Someone, something like this does not wipe out someone, a whole business. Like multiple businesses are talking about bankruptcy and mm -hmm. all these things are happening. And those are real jobs. And those are places that help to feed families. So mm -hmm. COVID has changed that. And what I will say on the positive side of that, COVID has shown us the power of technology. Mm -hmm. Those companies that were able to be quick and, and agile and switch over and begin to work on um work on the technology platforms or do cool interesting things even if it was outside of technology they're doing much better than those who were not able to adjust um mm -hmm. like i was talking to you earlier like i haven't been to a grocery store i order mine through a gross through a, a gig system right that allows me to hire someone to get my groceries to come in um mm -hmm. so things like that uh people are using amazon to buy things that they uh, normally would go out to the store to get. So there's all these things that can happen, but unless we look at COVID and saw and look at how we were not prepared, we're not gonna be able to prepare for the next thing. Cause there's gonna be something else. Like it's, this it's isn't the first or last, it's always gonna be something else. And the good thing is we're gonna be where we need to be to make sure that we're innovative enough to, to solve the problems when they get here. But let's not wait then, we can do that now. Right. Like you said, times can change at a drop of a dime and we must plan and prepare. I love that. I had to write that down. All right. So what are your, we're talking about economy and changing economy. What are your, what are, let's say your three biggest concerns um, with the changing economy? Um, my three biggest concerns, uh, I'm going to take an equity lens because I haven't taken that yet. Sure. Right now, we already have issues in education for certain populations, whether mm -hmm. that's uh, based on your demographics or based on, when I say demographics, based on your race, ethnicity, income, like, I mean, like, all those different factors that determine if you get a good education in this country. Right. We know that we already have concerns or issues in those areas as it relates to people with certain demographics getting access to jobs or having access to jobs. Right. Specifically in Baltimore City, Baltimore County, and Howard County, those are three very different counties. Baltimore City, um, and I know before, like before I left the state of Maryland government, there was a plan to do a line across the city, a, um, a subway line across the city to connect people to jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, that line didn't happen, right? So there's a lot of complaints, especially in the city, about n kids not having access to jobs and the kids who spray, the, they're called squeegee boys, who spray the windows and clean the cars. And a lot of people complain about that. Um, but these kids have access to quick money um, by doing that. But the thing about technology is technology also gives you access to money and to income that you would never have had before. Like if we look at how people are incentivizing or using uh, technology tools like YouTube, Instagram, people are making, in some cases, five, mm -hmm. six, seven figures um, by creating their own work or own job and being very entrepreneurial about how they use technology. Mm -hmm. And we have to make sure those groups, so the first thing is we have to make sure groups who are disenfranchised and we know don't have access currently aren't left behind when technology continues to grow. That's the like main thing that for me is like very important in this because the gap is only going to get wider. For those of us who, who do have a, um, who are like in a middle class and have education, for the most part, we'll be able to shift. But for those right. who don't have access to capital and who are a part of certain groups that have been disenfranchised, they are not going to be able to shift as quickly as we are. So we do need to make sure that happens. Second, jobs are going to change drastically. Like, and we need to stop ignoring that. We've already seen the taxi industry almost was completely wiped out by Uber. Like, let's be honest. But guess what? They were able to react. Imagine had they planned that and had been um, an innovator in that. They were able to react. Blockbuster wasn't. Blockbuster thought the play was videos. Netflix knew it. we didn't want videos that way. We wanted videos on demand. So Netflix was able to change that. So making sure that we have the jobs that allow people 
um, to learn about the skills needed to push technology. That doesn't mean coding for me. That doesn't mean like hardcore coding. It right. means understanding what is the intersection of my job with technology and with innovation. Like we're no longer in a world where you're going to be able to have one skill and be okay. Like jobs are going to be moving so quickly. Skills are going to be transitioning so quickly, especially as technology continues to speed up. And my concern is that if we're not able to create agile and an agile workforce, meaning mm -hmm. that people can shift and change based on the demands, we're going to be in a really bad situation. And finally, I think it's important that leadership understands this and actually does something about it. I am very concerned that in Washington, we do not have leaders in Congress and in other places that understand the impacts of data, technology, artificial intelligence, and all the things that come with that. And they're kind of like, oh, there's this thing happening. Let's do, let's ask questions of someone. We don't even know what questions right. to ask about these tools. And then they kind of like ignore it and walk away. Our data is, our data is not protected in a way that it should in this country. Um, the, the European Union has done some really cool things around data laws, but in reality, there are ethical concerns that I have as it relates to data and technology. We know that data can be biased and have mm -hmm. biases in it because data is collected by humans and humans are biased. Now imagine multiplying that on technology and how that can harm people. Like right now, mm -hmm. it's like, ha ha ha, I signed over my rights to my data to get TikTok. But then it's like, what are you really signing over? And if we know that most people are not going to read those terms and conditions mm -hmm. and that it can actually cause problems and access into this country in a way that that is harmful, right? Why aren't we thinking about that? And why aren't we making mm -hmm. plans to ensure not to restrict? Um, I'm all about like people can be capitalism is fine. I own my own business and all that. That stuff is important. But when it comes to personalized data, I think we have to think about that very differently going into the future. Sounds good. So what I'm hearing is that we have to be prepared. Um, we have to look out for those who are um, in those disenfranchised areas. And we need to hold our leaders accountable because we have these leaders who are in office. Some have been in, on, on the Hill for years and years and years and right. nothing is changing. They're just there for corporate interests. But we have to make sure that we are electing people who are there for the people and who will help to prepare and be a voice for the people. So, And um, they're for the people of tomorrow, not for the right, people right, right. of 20 years ago. And right. I, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I think no, that's important ahead. that we're not, we're, I'm concerned that they're not looking towards the future. I'm not talking about the future of 50 years. I'm talking about the future of five to 10 years, right. the very immediate future where we do not think about the way that we do work in this country. And that if Congress doesn't act to ensure that you don't lose your benefits um, because your job is obsolete in the next 10 years, or you don't lose your health insurance because of that, or things like that, or you have the training you need because we incentivize. Um, corporations to make sure you have training or incentivize you to go right. get your own training. If we don't do that, I think that is, a, um, I think that's harmful and it shows a lack of wanting to progress. Like I'm not, I said in one of the videos, it's like, I feel like they're more concerned about um, maintaining their own jobs, but we know there are real <laughs> jobs at risk. And that's a lot of people at risk. 38% up to 38% is a very high number of jobs. That's important. So I'm going to shift. You have you've received some questions from people who just um, sent some in. Mm -hmm. um, so this uh, person said Maryland is the wealthiest state in the union, but for Baltimore City, it seems that crime and poverty are the highest per capita. How do you plan to address this? So one of the things that's very important to me, um, I have a three uh, three priorities: focus on family or focus on the future of families, the future of work, which is what we're talking about today, and the future of communities. Under the future of communities, one of the things that is interesting about Maryland District 7 is we have three, three counties slash cities um, in our district. So we have Howard County, Baltimore County, Baltimore City. When we talk directly about what the, the city work, um, I believe in working together and erasing those boundaries. I think that we should be working together at the local, state, and federal level to ensure that we are all pushing towards the same goals. I'm concerned that if 800 different people have 800 different plans, we're not, we're moving like a, a centimeter on everything and nothing's right. really getting moved. We know what our big issues are in each county, like each county has a very good understanding of what those issues are. And what I want to do is work with those local member, local leaders to mm -hmm. ensure that we can work on those things and push those things back up to the hill so that we can get some of those things passed. And for Baltimore City in particular, as it relates to crime, that is something that is at that local level and we're really working with the mayor and the governor and ensuring that we are pushing the funding that we need to make sure that crime is not something you worry about. I live in Baltimore City. 
So I do understand that. I, I have heard gunshots. I see the reports all day, whether it's through Ring app or um, next door or on the news. So those are real concerns. And I remember being on um, a town hall with a young person and he asked like, how are we able to get to normal? And I didn't even realize what that meant. And that hit me so hard that for him, his life was not normal. And that we have let this happen for decades where a child does not feel like he is in a normal place to live, not because of something he's done, not because of anything that child has ever uh, contributed to or anything else. He was just born in a place where violence has been accepted for decades. And I think we have to work together. And we used to do a better job of that decades ago. Like I remember people working together across like the state, county and across these different things mm -hmm. and different places I've lived in my life. And now I feel like everyone's like, it's just me, it's just me. And we can't right. solve real problems by making it so, um, so uh, siloed. And right. even I, I look back to like some of the places that are solving things like the opioid crisis, they had to break all those walls down. So mm -hmm. in order for us to solve things like crime and work on things like that, it can't be me, you, you, him pointing all his fingers. We have to work together and really work together and not work together in a way that's a motive for you to get reelected. Like kids dying should never be okay. Humans dying should never be okay. Even during the midst of COVID, we're still having deaths. Like that is a problem. It and is. for that reason, I do understand that uh, poverty, that's something we can impact with economic development. I think that is important to make sure that we do um, put money into uh, physical infrastructure. That's one of the um, plans I have for my priority under future communities because we have to make sure we have access to broadband internet. The physical mm -hmm. infrastructure is there. And that's like, transit roads and things like that and then also the technology infrastructure um there are plenty of smart cities and things like that that are popping up everywhere and if mm -hmm. cities like baltimore um and counties like howard and baltimore county don't have the connectivity they need we won't be what that person said one of the top income makers in the country if we're not right. thinking about our infrastructure in a way that is innovative <laughs> and bless you and that is focused on the future of how we do communities Good. So we um, to answer that question, we're going to first focus on the future of family, future of work, future of communities, and just um, start working across lines. I think that if we start working across lines and see that you give a little, you give a little, we can gain a whole lot. Exactly. So that's very, very important. So to the next question, the person says, what are your plans to promote and protect the rural farming community? So farming is a really big um, part of my history, uh, my family history. Um, my family on both sides either farmed or were sharecroppers or um, garden to eat and things like that since I since I was a young person. I have two cousins who still farm now like in a big way and they teach farming classes. Um, one does so in Baltimore City, Baltimore County. The other one does so in North Carolina where my dad's from. But I think what's important about that is that we have to make sure and I, I'm not sure if this person's getting, I'm sure they're getting to like local farming and not necessarily big businesses. But I think we have to make sure that um, there are protections in place for things like disaster recovery. Mm. Um, we know that we've had hurricanes and things hit here. And even with this, right, with um, workers not being able to work due to COVID, that actually impacts the farming community in a way that mm -hmm. is substantial. So we have to make sure there's protections in place for that. I also think it's important that we use um, country of origin labeling. And even if, to the point of like saying this was made in your city, especially for um, or county, especially for like local local mm -hmm. folks, so we can make sure that people are buying back into their community and yes. ensuring that we have rural investments into areas. Um, a lot of times the rural communities aren't looked at, they're kind of left alone. And that's why a lot of people in rural counties are not feeling like they're in the same country everyone else is in. They feel like they've been left mm -hmm. alone uh, and been ignored in every single election. And that mm -hmm. is a problem. Like I've lived, my family's from rural America. And I've mm -hmm. lived there temporarily as a child and I see the lack of resources and access. And although the cities may be booming, the counties could always can have problems because they don't have that connectivity, don't have that access. So I just think it's important that we have a rural, suburban and urban plan that looks at how do we improve those situations for all, not just focus on the cities where we know people are gonna get jobs and things like mm -hmm. that, but how can we also use distance learning, distance work, and things like that to ensure that those folks have what they need. And broadband is very important in that conversation. Because if you have technology increasing, but folks can't get access to high-speed internet, 
like we're literally leaving them behind in yeah. places where we know um, Walmart's are coming in, taking over uh, or taking over for small mom and pop shops and stuff like that in this country. Um, so it's important for us to make sure we have a rural, urban, and city uh, initiative. Good stuff. So protections for all, and we're looking for a rural and urban initiative. So I look forward to hearing more about that from you. Um, the next question it says, what are your plans to reduce taxes? There's that word to reduce taxes, to keep and encourage Maryland families and businesses? So I know um, President Trump recently passed, a, um, passed a, a tax reduction for most Americans. A lot of folks felt some mm -hmm. relief from that. Um, but I think one thing that I think is important when you have the tax conversation, a lot of people get afraid to reduce taxes because that normally means programs are going to be cut. Mm -hmm. And so people are like, oh, no, we can't do that because this means this. And I think you can reduce taxes if we improve the way we implement laws and programs. Like I, mm -hmm. I think the use of pilots when um, Congress enacts laws, piloting programs to see what works and actually testing for it so that we're actually investing in programs to actually show a um, return, on, return on investment. My concern is that a lot of programs, we do have a lot of, um, I've worked in a government and I've worked with um, agencies to see like where their fluff was or see where we can move stuff. So there's a lot of fluff in there that you can fix. Um, mm -hmm. Not to say you need to cut a program, but there's better way to do better ways to do things to ensure that you're getting the maximum um, result for whatever your investment is. And I think the more we actually put in evidence based policymaking within mm -hmm. Congress, then we'll have a, the ability to actually cut where we need to cut and then move things where we need to move things. And then you're able to actually cut taxes in a way that's meaningful. I don't think you should just cut taxes and then say, oh, but forget these programs, forget um, uh, Department of Education, forget all these different areas. I think if you put in programs or in laws that are evidence-based and require evaluation, I think that, that makes us be more transparent about what's working and what's not. And then it makes us know if it's not working, it needs to come off the books. Like there shouldn't right. be a world where we just let laws linger that aren't working or let programs linger that aren't working. Like that doesn't work in sorry to bring up the private sector, kind of they're very different. That doesn't work in private sector. If some of these programs were in private sector, people would have lost jobs. Not to say we want to do that. That's not what I'm saying it for. I'm saying it for the, some of the efficiencies that do come with using data can be used in government. And I think a lot of governments are doing that. I know Maryland um, is a heavy data state and understands that. Um, Baltimore City is a heavy data city. Howard County does does a lot of stuff with data specifically around, um, even around healthcare and things like that. So there's different ways to use data and evidence-based policy making to make sure that we're implementing things that are actually working. And then we look at cuts. Good stuff. All right, your next question is, what are your plans to upscale the Randallstown Liberty area? Randallstown so that, Liberty. Yes, so what uh, Randallstown um, is, for those who may be in the other parts of the district, Randallstown is in Baltimore County. Um, in Randallstown, originally, they were supposed to be uh, one of the stops on the subway that went out that way, but mm -hmm. they didn't get one of the stops. I think the next stop is Owens Mills, but they're mm -hmm. close to that. So Randallstown has been kind of um, left alone. And I think that person probably asked that question because they want to know, like, how are you, you're interested in revitalizing. I think that goes back to my future of communities um, okay. concept. It's like, if we're going to push, if we need to push um, infrastructure, period, we know our infrastructure in this country is failing in so many ways. Our bridges, tunnels, and what have you have gone through a lot of rigorous review, and we know a lot of them do not get tested, and a lot of them are in very bad situations. We have um, those things in the state of Maryland, um, and even with our roads and things like that, we know that the, some of those things are not where they need to be. Our technology infrastructure is not where it needs to be to ensure that we're competitive as these companies continue to push out technology. So I think the, the play for that is to make sure that we do have that rural urban um, city um, initiative where we're making sure the physical technology infrastructure are there. And then again, working directly with local state and federal um, stakeholders to make sure we can get things done. Okay, sounds good. So it sounds like that rural urban plane is very, very important and more um, of our legislators need to start thinking that way. So I'm glad to see that you're thinking mm -hmm. that way. So here's a question, uh, another one, uh, not related to future of work, but okay. they wanted to ask, it says, as a millennial voter, I am very tired of the status quo and the current state of our stagnant bicameral legislature. Okay. How will you, that's what I said, okay. Uh, <laughs> and a real question, um, not to say none of the rest of them are. Let me clarify. I understand what you're saying. 
How will you, okay, so let me start. As a millennial voter, I'm very tired of the status quo and the current state of our stagnant, le stagnant bicameral legislature. Mm -hmm. How will you bring a new energy and fresh perspective? Um, I understand your frustration. I would do want to say that first. Um, I, I think it is, it's amazing to me that this country is mostly independent when we look at the data. Um, mm -hmm. Like there's more independents than individuals who are Republican and, and individuals who are Democrat. And I think that's because people just want to get things done and they want to make things work. So I think what is important for me as it relates to that question is that I bring my experience where I have worked with both Democrats and Republicans in Maryland. Mm -hmm. Specifically, I work for the state of Maryland. I worked under Governor, um, former Governor O'Malley and current Governor Hogan um, in programs that focus on government performance. And that was very important for me. It wasn't important for me to be like, oh, you're a Democrat. I'm here. You're Republican. I'm not here. It was, I need to work with whoever wants to get things done for the people of Maryland right. in, that, in that situation. And even in my um, most previous job, I worked with states across the country and some were red, some were blue. And I had to go in there and talk to them about data and talk to them about technology and talk to, to, to them about the ethical considerations to think about when you're implementing technology in a government system. And it wasn't about red, white, or blue, like it, or red and blue, excuse me. It was definitely about how we're going to do this thing or whatever it was that I was helping implement for the people. How am I going to make government work better for the people? And mm. I think we have to move away from calling out, oh, Democrat this, Republican this, or using trigger words, like we know what the trigger words are, abortion, gun rights, um, or firearm rights, depending on which side you're on, you're gonna use different words, right? So there's these words that trigger people where they literally stop listening to one another. Mm -hmm. And there are real problems that we have facing our economy and facing our society that we need to work on. We need to work on pandemics and ensure that our response is the right response, making sure we're using data for that. We need to understand natural disasters are not going anywhere. Hurricane season is coming. How are we responding to natural, di natural disasters? Cybersecurity is a huge issue that almost every, if not every, state chief information officer is concerned about because right. your data is at risk now that we have all this technology going on and uh, different technologies talking to each other. So there's these, there's these huge issues that we need to work on. And what I'll say to that young person who asked that question mm -hmm. um, is that you um, have the power and we have the power together to, to no longer accept the battering and the fighting and bickering back and forth to say, hey, right. what are you gonna actually do and actually hold us, including me if I make it there, accountable by voting, accountable by calling, mm -hmm. accountable by sending letters, accountable by reporting if someone does something wrong to the news. Like we have a responsibility to our vote. And mm -hmm. I think that's a very important, but I plan to bring a, a, a spirit of let's work together because that's what I've always done. I am an army brat, so that's what you do. You mission over anything else mm -hmm. and you work together no matter uh, who's around you or what the person believes in next to you. And one of the things I believe in, I was taught early on by one of my youth pastors was about the sweet spot. And it basically says that everyone has one thing in common. And you normally find that one thing in common and then you build a relationship off of that. We're not going to agree on everything. There's no person who's going to agree 100% with everything that you believe in. It's just, not, it's going to be rare. If it's rare, maybe there's a percent chance somewhere based on statistics. There's a 0, 0.00 something um, percent chance of that happening. But with that being said, you just want to make sure that uh, we are working together. And I believe I bring that spirit no matter what environment I'm in. And I've seen you bring that spirit, so I fully agree. All right, so the next question is about vaccinations. Uh, the person says, what is uh, her position on the implementation of possible mandatory vaccinations? So this question has been going around a lot, um, especially with COVID in the mm -hmm. search for a vaccination currently. My opinion on vaccinations is that I believe that in this country, we are, we are in a free country and that is you have the right, and I believe you're given those things, to say yes or no to a vaccination. I don't believe someone should come to you and be like, hey, you have to do this thing um, right. or what have you. But I do believe that people in this country, because of the freedoms we're given, we should not force someone to do anything as it relates to um, something of that nature, such as vaccinations. I know most people do get back, we get, well, I've been vaccinated. We all have gotten vaccinated on two different um, scales and things like that. Um, but I'm not interested in passing a law that forces someone to vaccinate. And I think that's what that person is trying to get to. Good stuff. All right, our next and final question says, uh, also, I guess they asked another question. Also, what is her stance on the protection of the religious, religious exemption rights being protected if placed on the table to be eliminated in the current climate of 
COVID-19 concerns? Mm. So um, one, I think a lot, uh, I do know people who do use the religious, religious exemption to not get vaccinated. And I know there's like a, a fight back and forth about whether that's right or wrong. I don't have an opinion of whether that's right or wrong. I do know that we do have that in place because there are certain rules in people's religions that do not, um, for them that is as they're doing a very bad thing if they actually take that step. I do think we need to keep religious protections in place for people. Like that's one thing this country was built off on um, was making sure you have religious freedom um, and ensuring that folks have the ability to exercise that re religious freedom. Now, as long as that religious freedom isn't in any freedom, isn't hurting someone else, right? Freedom is when you're allowed to do something. It's not causing mass harm to everyone else. Because when it's mass harm, we put a law in it and we, we correct for that. But I do think that people should be allowed to, based on their religion, um, opt out of that if that's something they believe in and doesn't cause uh, harm to others. Okay, so that was the last question. So today we talked about uh, future of work uh, and your position is about the future of family, future of work, the future of communities. Um, what I, one thing that I heard is that we must plan, we must prepare. It is very, very important for us to plan and prepare. Uh, and we must work across the aisle and also work yep. across within the state, the state, yep. the local. Um, and so people, if you're here, make sure that you're planning and preparing. You may be home, but there's so many free resources for you. Uh, for those of you who have access to technology, I know that mm -hmm. Harvard is offering some free classes. Coursera is always available. Um, so make sure that you are doing what you need to do to uh, sharpen your skill sets because the world has changed and will continue to change. Right. Um, so with that being said, Amber, I want them, how can people get in contact with you? How can they volunteer? And sure. how can they donate? So um, my website is ivy2020.com, I-V-E-Y 2020.com. And that has almost all the information uh, that you need to be able to either sign the petition to get me on the ballot. I am an independent. Independents operate totally different out of the current system. Maryland, let me just speak on this for a quick second. Maryland okay. has two main parties, well, three technically, um, but I'll speak to two as Democrats and Republicans. They primary June 2nd. Everyone else, whether you're Green Party, Libertarian, Independent, or fill in the blank, you don't primary, you petition. So you get signatures from folks to get on the November ballot. And we have to do that by August 2nd. So because I launched later on, um, what I'm doing right now is spending time getting to know people, introduce myself to folks, whether it's through text, email, phone calls, um, because we cannot leave our houses right now, especially if you're in the, the cities or counties uh, that has said the stay in place order is uh, continuing. Um, so yeah, you can reach out to me via ivy2020.com. And if you want to sign the position, it's ivy2020.com backslash S-I-G-N or backslash sign. Okay, and for our younger people who are following, how can they follow you, find you on social media? Oh yeah, most definitely. So Facebook and Twitter are both Ivy2020. And then, um, what's that on? Instagram is ivy for congress md 7 And you can follow me there. We also have events we do. Um, this live event is happening with the town hall. We'll post that on YouTube for folks mm -hmm. who couldn't make it tonight. And then we, all, we also have a Zumba fundraiser coming up on Thursday. If you're interested in joining that, it's ivy2020.com backslash events. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of cool things happening, trying to figure out different ways to reach out to people because this is, no one expected our campaign Nobody. to be in the house um, via text and computer. So we're just trying to figure out unique ways to reach out to folks and thankful for folks for dealing with it, dealing with the text messages, right. dealing with the emails. I know at times it can be overwhelming, but please right. understand we're doing it out of... Um, a need and want to to meet you all at, in a most efficient way and safest way possible, right. as possible. Good stuff. Last words? Um, my last words are, uh, I'm super appreciative of folks, uh, once again, for joining today. I think that I chose those three priorities and they all have future in them for a reason. Um, the reason is that our future is not going to be the same. And I think that we have to have leaders who are looking ahead and for plan mm -hmm. and planning for the future versus being reactionary to it. Um, no one knew COVID was happening this year um, and that we are, our lives are gonna be changed this much. But we do know that things like COVID will continue to happen. We do know what some of our threats are and that we can prepare for those and ensure that the American people don't feel stressed or depressed and all the things that are happening right now because most people don't know what's going on and don't know what their future looks like. A lot of that anxiety can be reduced. So I hope if you have, 
or if you're interested or heard anything today that interests you, I hope that you continue to follow the campaign. Um, and if you're really interested, uh, make sure you sign that position. But I'll be having at different events. And if you follow any of those platforms, you'll be able to hear more about it. Good stuff. So you said that our future will not be the same and we must have a leader who is prepared to bring about those changes. And I believe that person is you. So thank you thank guys you, for Julie. joining us. And, and thank you for our moderating. I truly appreciate it. Oh, no problem. It's always a pleasure to support you. And you all, you can also get one of these t-shirts. How can they get one of these? <laughs> I want That's this also on the website. Yep. On the That's website awesome. under the shop, Ivy2020 backslash shop. But yeah. Awesome. And even if you don't, like, if it, they may think it's AI, artificial intelligence. So you don't even have to um, necessarily like my initials. But my initials are AI, which makes this all ironic. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it all so wonderful. <laughs> so guys, thank you so much for joining us. And please look out for the next events. There's so much, she has so many things that are coming up to, to meet people, all types of people, all demographics. So um, join in, support, support, support. Did thank I you, say support? Um, <laughs> so thank you guys. And uh, you guys have a good night. You too. Have a good one. Thank you. You too. Bye. Goodbye.